Hello and welcome everyone. I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started. Um, let's do this and full screen. All right. So welcome everyone to tonight's uh, presentation by Taipei Cooper and the Herbal Balance Study Center, the Herbal Balance Lecture Series. Today, the March 28th, uh, the first of two events we have around Cranbrook, understanding Cranbrook design. And the first event is um, the network effect. So my name is Alexander. I am uh, one of the instructors in the Type of Cooper program that's hosting today's uh, lecture. For those who are not familiar, Type of Cooper is a postgraduate uh, certificate program in typeface design, but also much more than that. We have a lot of uh, lectures and workshops around type and design. Uh, we also have uh, two more lectures in, in the series. So obviously uh, the second part of the Understanding Cranbrook Design event, which will be next Monday, if you haven't registered for that, um, you can go to the coopertype.org um, and see uh, a register for that. So uh, the second part is at 6.30 on next Monday. And the lunchtime event also next Friday, uh, we have, um, a continuation of a series of, of a lecture that we had last year called Dusting Latin Type Type History Number Two Start Making Sands uh, as an S A N S of uh, uh, France. So it's a, it's a lecture by Sebastian Morligan talking about the history of uh, the French sans serif design, sort of the origins of that. So that's at 12 30 next Monday, 6 30, the second Cranberg event. So don't miss those. Um, and you can find more. Uh, information and sign up for that at coopertype.org. Um, this lecture is being recorded uh, and will be added to our growing extended archive of lectures going back now six years, over 60 videos. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Type Culture for that. Um, Type Culture is um, giving us the opportunity to record and continue adding these. So Type Culture is a digital type foundry and an academic resource uh, for all things related to typeface design. So check them out if you're not familiar with them and thanks to type culture again um i'd like to um uh begin by by introducing um the event um and introducing our panel uh, i will be co-moderating it so first and foremost a good evening to everybody and just a really quick um note about like why we're here um obviously we're talking about cranbrook um cranbrook academy of art uh, an incredibly important and influential institution. Everyone on the panel today is a graduate of Cooper Union, including myself. I'm a, a proud alumni of Cooper Union and of Cranbrook. So I'm very happy to be with my, my peers and colleagues uh, and the extended family of Cranbrook, uh, or as we call it, Cranbrook Mafia. I'm sure every school has their own little mafia, but we're very happy in this, in this uh, space. So uh, if you're you know, not familiar, I'm sure you you should be familiar with with uh, with uh, uh, Cranbrook as, as a bigger in institution, but that was founded in 1932 uh, as as this incredible uh, graduate school for um, uh, uh, design, architecture, uh, and uh, famously New York Times called it a, um, uh, incredibly influential. And, and the quote was the 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 effect of Cranbrook and its graduates and faculty on the physical environment of this country has been profound. Cranbrook surely more than any other institution has a right to think itself as synonymous with contemporary American design. That's a very lofty uh, framework, which I hope we are living up to, but I think it's like a very uh, big uh, statement coming uh, from, from a very important place, but it's a beautiful campus. It's a, it's a sprawling campus uh, just north of Detroit that has created this incredible legacy of design work, architecture work, and I think in, in, in incredible ways shaped and transformed uh, American graphic design and, and global graphic design. So it's one of the things we really wanted to delve a little bit closer. I have a selfish interest in it as, as a designer, as an alumnus, but also from the standpoint of a lecture series, to kind of great, give a little bit more perspective on it. And what we want to talk, talk about today is the Cranbrook Designs network effect, sort of how it influences um, the graduates and, 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 and um, uh, going out kind of into the greater field in terms of the uh, specific growth of educational schools and, and educational models, um, how other design programs are influenced by the, the legacy of Cranbrook design. So we have an incredible panel today, uh, crossing generations of Cranbrook graduates that represent uh, very important moments in, in, in time and, and people who have incredible practice um, and who are 
embedded in, in American graphic design education. So we want to kind of bring them together and talk about like their experience and their perspective on uh, Cranbrook education, but also thinking about the future. And, and obviously we're here in a, in a virtual environment, uh, a testament to the last couple of years that we've been living in uh, semi-isolation of, of, of Zoom uh, virtual space. So um, obviously talking about that as an influence um, on how we teach. So kind of wanted to, to bring that together. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, our panel and uh, give you a, a glimpse into the wonderful folks we have represented today. So first and uh, foremost, I'm just gonna start with Lorraine Wild. Lorraine is a graphic designer in Los Angeles. A design from Green Dragon Office focuses on collaborative work with artists, architects, curators, editors, and publishers. In addition, uh, she serves as the creative design consultant to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, consulting on publications, exhibitions, and design for public outreach. She's a member of the faculty of the California Institute of the Arts. Uh, Lorraine is the AAGA gold medalist winner from 2006, one of the highest, if not the highest uh, award in the uh, United States for graphic designers. Her recent projects include the design of books and exhibition catalogs for the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Cranbrook Academy of Art Museum, and the, um, the Kessner Gesellschaft in Hanover. She is, of course, a graduate of Cooper Union Academy, uh, sorry, Cranbrook Academy of Art, a uh, different institution, Cranbrook Academy of Art, and Yale School of Art. The second panelist uh, is Lucille Tanazas. Lucille is a graphic designer and educator based in New York and San Francisco. She is the Henry Wolf Professor of Communication Design at Parsons School of Design. Her work is at the intersection of typography and linguistics with design that reflects complex and poetic means of visual expression. Lucille was the national president of the AAGA uh, from 1996 to 1998 and was awarded the AAGA medal in 2013 for her lifetime contribution to design practice and outstanding leadership in design education. She received the National Design Award for Communication Design from the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum in 2002. Originally from Manila, Philippines, Lucille received her MFA in design from Cranbrook Academy of Art in 1982. Next up is uh, Elliot Earls. Uh, Elliot is the current artist in residence and head of the graduate graphic design 2D department at Cranbrook Academy of Arts. He led the graduate program at Cranbrook since 2001. Uh, I was a student of Elliot's uh, back in 2005 and 2007. Um, spent many days in that office, uh, the space that you will see in a second when, when you see Elliot's uh, face show up in the grid. Um, he works as a designer, performer, and artist, and is represented in public and private collections, including the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, the Wolfsonian Museum, and the Miami Art Museum. Has been exhibited widely, including an installation at the Tri uh, Triennale Museum in Milan. As a performance artist, Elliot was awarded an Emerging Artist Grant from Enhanced Prestigious Worcester Group, and he has performed globally, including featured shows during uh, the Exit Festival and at the Music Hall Detroit. I think I was at that show, or at least one of the shows in, in Music Hall, so I can remember that fondly. Next up is Nicole Killian. Nicole Killian explores the overlaps between publishing and pedagogy through writing, workshops, and serial form. Nicole has exhibited widely, including in Richmond, Detroit, London, Berlin, and Hanzhou. Their writing has been published by Wao Ha, The Enemy, The Journal of Feminist Scholarship, Garage, and served as guest editor for the Walker Arts Center's Soundboard. And they organized How Will We Queer Design Education Without Compromise? Um, they are currently director of the Design Visual Communication MFA and associate professor in the Department of Graphic Design at Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, Nico Fontana is their publishing initiative concerned with the querying of language, objects, bodies, and spaces. Nicole's studio is based in Richmond, Virginia. Um, next up is Kelsey Elder. Uh, Kelsey Elder is an educator typographer based in Providence, Rhode Island. He is interested in how typographic technologies impact the development of language and the relationship access to these technologies has had with social movement making. He is currently an associate professor of graphic design at the Rhode Island School of Design and has previously taught at Purchase College, the state of the State of University of New York, and Virginia Commonwealth University. 
He received his BFA in graphic design from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, his MFA in 2D design from Cranbrook Academy of Art, and is a graduate of the typeface design intensive at the University of Reading. Last but not least, my co-moderator today is Matt Owens. Matt is a founding partner and creative project lead at Athletics, a studio based here in New York and Brooklyn. Born and raised in Texas, he studied graphic design at the Cranbrook Academy of Art before moving to New York during the heydays of Silicon Alley. In New York, Matt developed self-initiated design projects, including some now featured in SF MoMA's permanent collection, and work with clients like Sony, Nike, and the Cooper Hewitt. Matt founded uh, his studio Athletics in 2004 with Jason uh, Genevikov. Uh, at Athletics, Matt has led projects for clients, including Music Together, The Pulitzer Prizes, and JP Morgan. In spare time, he can be found sketching custom type designs and developing new ventures like Kingston Standard, an upstate-based brewing company he founded in 2018. So with that, I will invite everybody to our virtual stage <laughs> and uh, we will kick off the conversation uh, by starting kind of a, a round of questions um, that I will ask and um, take turns with Elliot, uh, sorry, with Matt taking questions from folks. So we're gonna set up the little grid here. I like to call it the Brady Brunch grid. So let me switch to that. Um, so hopefully, we're grid. Awesome. So um, obviously, um, as, as sort of the um, opening remarks kind of uh, allude to, everybody's an educator and everyone has had uh, the experience of going through Cranbrook. And so one of the first questions I wanted to start with is, what is the pedagogy of Cranbrook design in your view? So with that, I would love to ask Lorraine to, to maybe kind of get us started. What do you think the pedagogy of Cranbrook design is? Well, you know, hi. Um, <laughs> the one thing I think needs to be said from the outset is that for each person on this panel, there's probably a slightly different answer because we represent different points in the history of the program and the program has, you know, really evolved. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a student of the McCoys um, and then some are students of Lori and Scott and some of Elliot. So there's been a kind of evolution um, all along. Um, the other thing that makes it hard to make, say general, generalize about Cranbrook is because of the lack of a formal curriculum. And so that, that basic uh, eccentric nature of Cranbrook where you chart your own course through your study means that you have this highly individualized experience. But I think in general, you know, it's funny, there wasn't a lot of, when I was there and I was there really, you know, in the mid seventies. So at the very beginning of the McCoy's tenure, there wasn't a great deal of talk at that point about the legacy of Cranbrook. Everybody kind of knew who'd gone through there. There was certainly, um, you know, an awareness of the Eameses, although in a way in the mid seventies, that was even before the big, you know, cultural uh, love affair with mid-century modernism. So even, you know, the fifties seemed not that you know, not that kind of definitional. It wasn't really until that show um, in the 80s at the Met that kind of set out a, a narrative of the history of Cranbrook. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that the McCoys, when I was a student there, they weren't looking to the history of Cranbrook, although you're there in that environment and you kind of can't avoid it. But what seemed to have stuck from you know, the very beginnings of Elil Saarinen's concept of the place was that you couldn't actually devise a curriculum to train an artist, that it wasn't really possible, that what you could do was just provide an environment and a com community to allow people to, again, craft this individualized path. And you know, the McCoys like, uh, you know, kind of abided by that. And, I would say at the point that I studied with them, what they were masterful about was kind of 
laying out the kind of giving you a lay of the land of like how the world of design was constructed so you could kind of figure out where you wanted to chart your course um you know it was they were just incredible at making it all seem like all you had to do was figure that out and there would be a place for you you know it was very very liberating um there was no sense of you know having to be put through uh a kind of um again a kind of strict idea of how you created a graphic designer. So I experienced it as an enormously liberating place. And, um, and that's what I think, I, again, I can't speak for everybody. Everybody will have to reiterate whether they feel that way or not. But it was in that lack of structure that I was certainly able to grow. mute i i i would definitely echo that like i i was you know went to cranbrook in 2005 but that was the big appeal for me the unstructuredness of it so i, I definitely sort of reiterate that so i wanted to pass this off to lucille lucille how would you sort of characterize the the pedagogy of design from your perspective well um like what like lorraine said you know we we come from different contexts and Pedagogy was not even a word in my vocabulary uh, at the time. And I'm probably, I don't know if I'm the only one who came from another country and landed at Cranbrook with no, not, with no knowledge of what it was. You know, so I, I, I know that a lot of, uh, when you're going, when you're contemplating graduate school, you do a lot of research and you figure out where the right fit would be. Uh, but for me, it was actually a familial connection. So it was purely luck that I landed in Cranbrook. So if, uh, or I call it kismet, that somehow it was ordained uh, because an aunt of mine lived 10 minutes from Cranbrook who emigrated in the United States in the sixties and offered me the opportunity to go to graduate school. You know, she was my father's youngest sister. And, uh, and then I realized that Cranbrook was in an earlier, um, my, my knowledge bank because one of my friends from Manila uh, was sent to Cranbrook. She was uh, sent by the Philippine government in metalsmithing. And I was asking her, how, what is this school? I mean, you know, she's, I said, you know, my aunt lives nearby. So um, she said, uh, it just so happens that the first lady of the Philippines at the time, Imelda Marcos, uh, had, had looked at Cranbrook as a, the pinnacle of uh, her, her selection of national artists. So it turns out two of our national artists uh, ordained by the Marcos family um, were, were uh, Jose Hoya, who and Napoleon Abueva, who were there in the in the fifties. So that was the reason why my friend said, and I said, "Oh, perfect! It's my aunt lives nearby, so I'll go." Um, so I think, uh, you know, to go back, you know, I had no understanding really of pedagogy. You know, for me, being trained in the Philippines in the fine arts and advertising, it was really about, you know, where do you go? to expand your knowledge in the same field that I had been in and I had practiced as a designer. So when I landed at Cranbrook and I think Kathy, you know, I showed my portfolio to Kathy in the middle, uh, during the middle, in the middle of the winter break. And so I was probably the last person she accepted um, mid-year. And so when I landed at Cranbrook and showed up three weeks later, I was only there for the holidays really. And when I stayed um, to, uh, to begin my Cranbrook education, I was just blown away by the surroundings. It was so different from what, a, you know, a melting or kind of like a, a kind of congested city like Manila is, you know, suddenly it was its rolling hills and just beautiful landscape. So I think uh, when I, what I brought there was my, was a kind of, how can I say, it was almost like a facility. Uh, I was a very good I was, a, I was very good with my hands. <laughs> Let's put it that way. You know, I was a good artist. And, and, and so I, I, you know, I, I knew that somehow design involved an, an external, you know, an external force, you know, whatever that is, that it was not self-generated as an artist would do. Um, so I, I, I think it was, you know, when, when you think of how, what is my trajectory? And, and it was really a step-by-step, Kind of journey, and when I, 
when I saw that Cranbrook was, as Lorraine said, no structure, no classes, no grades, was so different from the education I had in the Philippines where I was, you know, I was, I went from one school, kinder, you know, from kindergarten to college, okay, in a Catholic girls school run by German nuns. That was very, very prescriptive. So, you know, suddenly I'm like free. It's a free for all. <laughs> and then I realized, what do I do here? Um, and I remember when, Ka when, I, when Kathy was giving us assignments and she said, you know, I'm just gonna go, go through the studio. And I said, is this what this is about? And so it was more about being inspired by my colleagues, my classmates who were there 24 hours a day. That was my pedagogy. So it was not in a book. You know, my classmates had books on the Bauhaus, which of course I you know, only even, not even like really familiarize myself. Uh, I, I didn't know much about Swiss design. So I had no influence, if you will. And maybe that naivete is what I think shows up in my work. And so the, 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 uh, the accumulation or the acquisition of theory, concept, uh, metaphor, all the things that enriches a design process, starting from plain, you know, plain talent with your hands, I think is pretty amazing. And that is what Cranbrook gave me. And so I think about what my experience was there. I mean, I was there in 82, so it's been 40 years plus, that that education is still as relevant to me as it was fumbling around when I was there. Uh, but I guess I was very, I was very pliant and I was very observant and observer, observant as well. That's great, thank you. Um, I guess next uh, would be Elliot. And Elliot, I guess, you know, th this is maybe like a harder, I mean, it's, I think it's a hard question for everybody, but it's, a, it's, it's doubly maybe hard for you because you went to Cranbrook and now are there as the artist in residence. So like, how do you see the pedagogy from those, those two perspectives as a former student and as a current artist in the residence? Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing that I say is I, I agree with everything that Lorraine and Lucille mentioned, and then I'm largely going to be building off of that. And then also I can't see the grid of, of people that uh, are participating, but I want to say hi to a number of my friends from, uh, from Cranbrook that I know are in the audience. But I think that you raise a really important question when I, when I, when I received your email, such a simple question can be so brain busting because I think it raises this, this, this concept of the Jungian shadow, which we can think of as the kind of um, those parts of our psyche, those parts of our experience that are largely inaccessible to ourselves. So to a degree, it is one of those things where I've, I've either had the fortune or the misfortune, it's actually not a misfortune, the fortune of, of, of only really teaching at Cranbrook. And so from inside the institution, I, I, I think that the one thing that I, that I will say is that um, having, been, having been here for 21 years, it is, it is completely a self-directed uh, program and it, it really relies on the, the, uh, the individuals. And I think the, the McCoys were, were particularly brilliant about um, about structuring a kind of uh, intellectual cocktail party. Uh, the thing that I think that I can bring to the conversation is a kind of a historical perspective on the changes that have, uh, that have um, taken place in a way. And I, I think the, 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 the main point that I'd like to kind of raise with regard to that is that I, that I truly and honestly believe that Cranbrook Academy of Art is a uh, is, a, is an extremely powerful idea that is, is threatened in a way, that, that the cultural pressures of the transactional nature of everything in our, in our contemporary culture really threatens, um, really threatens a, a beautiful set of ideas. And, um, you know, it's still, I think, I think Cranbrook is still in a very healthy place. And I think that there's tremendous, tremendously powerful work that's going on in, in the studios, but, I can say that the, the model that, that uh, Lorraine and Lucille are talking about and that I was educated under in, in the mid 1990s has so many pressures on it that it's, it's, um, it's really kind of difficult to, to discuss. And I think that the 13 now artist in residence, the director of the Cranbrook Academy of Art Museum, the former directors and the entire administrative uh, apparatus is really in place holding back a kind of high, holding back a kind of tide that is that is really um, 
you know, we think about ACAD and we think, which are fine institutions. I might have the actual names wrong, but the accreditation bodies that accreditate Cranbrook. Cranbrook, my understanding is that at least during my tenure of, 21, of a 21 year period, um, Cranbrook has been grandfathered in with regard to accreditation. So they come and they say, you know, you have no documentation of, of X, Y, or Z. You don't provide this, you don't provide this, you don't provide this. But when you look at the, the, the net results of the educational model, it's impossible to argue that the results, that, that the, the material results, as is evidenced by the people on this panel and the people in, some of the people in the audience, uh, it, it obviously works. So they, they, they routinely grandfather the academy into uh, to the, the capacity to provide, a, uh, to provide a degree. And then the last thing that I'll say, is simply that I do think that, that one of the things that Cranbrook, that the 2D department and, the, and, and the, the graphic design department does extremely well is it, it, it navigates a kind of uh, tenuous line uh, between this kind of extremely self-directed project uh, program of education and the kind of rigor that, that you would find in our critique methodology and in the kind of written components of, of, uh, of what we do. Uh, so I think it's a pretty amazing place. Yeah. Um, Nicole, do you want to <laughs> try that? I love this like down the line thing that's happening. Um, I, I agree with what everyone has said. Um, I was taking notes and thinking about how uh, two things that feel like very strong in Cranbrook's like pedagogical experiment is um, sort of the place. I think that you can't like that place moves you um, in, in one way or another. And, and sort of with that, um, with that place, something that I've, I haven't seen at any other institution that I've experienced or visited is um, the community. I think that I think that so much of Cranbrook's pedagogy is is about community and like communal pressure. Um, I've I've thought about that sort of phrase uh, before when I thought about my time at Cranbrook. That you know you're in the studio because your classmates are in the studio and Elliot's in the studio. Um, or whoever your artist in residence is. I think that that sort of model of sort of learning, learning from directly from your classmates, learning directly from the people that live down the street from you. Um, I can't imagine that happening anywhere else. Um, and it's something that I've, I feel like 10 years out of grad school, I keep trying to tease out of, you know, what I'm doing, what I see my colleagues do is this idea of like a pedagogy that is rooted in place and a pedagogy that's also rooted in community. Um, and those things can shape shift. But I think that for me, that feedback loop between those two is, is a really, um, is a re really moving aspect of what happens there, no matter who the people are. I think that that the place and the community are, um, or what I would add to the, the conversation here. Yeah, I remember when I first met Elliot, like the, Elliot described like the idea of the studio and like it really, for me, changed the, the notion of studio rather than a physical space It became like a group of people, you know? So I saw a studio, like whenever I would hear studio, it's like I associated with like, I'm going to go with my people rather than like, I'm going to go to a physical space. I really just for forever kind of will define that as like an epitome of, of that space. Um, Kelsey, what, what, what would you <laughs> say to that, to that question? I, yeah, thank you, Sasha. I would say it's, it's difficult to go after those four individuals and potentially try to contribute something that hasn't been said. I absolutely agree. Um, I think part of if I were to add anything to the conversation, it's that, you know, there is a sense of relation um, somewhere also inside of the pedagogy. Nicole sort of tackled that, speaking about community. Um, I only went to that place because someone who impacted me encouraged me to go there. And I then saw that through and then that place impacted, you know, like it, 
it was just sort of like this thing that kept chugging. Um, and I think in terms of the question towards like, how would I characterize the pedagogy? Something I think a lot about is how that place encourages you to be hyper present. Um, and, and I think Nicole kind of like hits on that by talking a little bit about, you know, I see what my peers are doing and that's sort of egging me on or encouraging me. And to the comments about place, that if you've ever been within that, that institution, you feel the spirits. Um, and I think like you can't really get outside of that. There's a pressure on all those idols, especially, you know, I graduated in 2016. So I went there thinking about um, sort of the history of Cranbrook and, and what it meant to be there. And so there's this sort of added burden and, and sort of the ghosts are always present, if you will. Um, and so I think like it, through all of that, there is this hyper um, fixation on being present and utilizing sort of every moment that you have. And in that way, it's if I were to put a name on the pedagogy, it would be really that it encourages experience. Um, and so like we observe and we are experiencing and we are making um, and we are talking about that. Um, and so I think if, if I were to sort of like place two more words into conversation, it might be something towards the effect of like, presentness and then also like pedagogy as experience. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, I'll pass this to Matt to, to do the second round of. of... Yeah, this, is, this is amazing. You know, I think a lot of what we covered on the first question about pedagogy kind of dovetails into the second question, which is sort of looking at Cranbrook vis-a-vis sort of other other institutions and other programs, you know, I think we understand, or at least I have a, I have a clear understanding of, of the, the uniqueness to the individual, right? It's like you go to Cranbrook and it is this kind of like self-directed program. And I actually, I'm going to go and I'm going to go reverse instead of a loop. And, you know, Kelsey, I wanted to hear from you about, you know, understanding Cranbrook and having gone there, but then thinking about other programs, you know, where, you know, where do those, where's that tension there? Where are the benefits and deficits? Is there a strength to Cranbrook that, that you know, we kind of understand its uniqueness and strength, but when we think about other programs, and of course you guys are teaching at other programs, like is there is there a tension there? Is there things that you see that are strengths that maybe Cranbrook doesn't have, or is there a uniqueness that you, you see in Cranbrook that isn't present in, in, in the program you're, you're in now? Yeah, um, so thanks for bouncing back. <laughs> yeah, just light uh, Monday night for me. Um, <laughs> I would say like obviously aspects which are unique and things that I see that are different than say our graduate program here at RISD there are definitely obviously no classes. And I would say the relationship of the faculty size to the graduate experience. Um, and so, you know, I absolutely went there to study with Elliot. Um, I knew what I was getting into. Um, I had drank in the Kool-Aid. I was like, all right, let's go. Um, and I think that is a benefit for a lot of individuals that are trying to figure out what design needs for them and they're learning how to speak and, and they're experiencing some senses of freedom in, in that um, for the first time. Um, I would say like, I was really fortunate in my time there that the institution had critical studies fellows um, and we had guests inside of 2D that also helped to sort of supplement um, ways of practice and ways of making that I was exposed to. Like notably Jack Halberstam was there um, and David Cobbianca um, was there too. And so it was like, oh, like kind of like queer theory and like, oh, typeface design, like, oh, those things can exist together. Like that's really unique. Um, and, and so I think, towards your question about like, where are challenges? How are different institutions different? You know, at RISD, any graduate student is afforded the ability to become close with the entire faculty cohort, which is, you know, 28 different people. Um, if we include part-time faculty, um, 13 if we count full-time. And so that is sort of like the give and take, which is there's a really intimate setting at Cranbrook where you're with these individuals for two years of your life. Um, and, and in that way, it's sort of familial. Um, but I think it has its benefit as someone who is a general introvert um, and would prefer a deep relationship with someone than something 
with a lot of different, like many different, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, um, I also think it just depends on the type of learner and what they want from a graduate program. There are many people who I, as much as I love Cranbrook, I'm like, oh, you might be better off looking at VCU or looking at RISD or thinking about CalArts or, you know, somewhere else. Um, and so I think it's also an understanding that like difference is good depending on what that student is, is looking for, the type of learner that they are. Yeah, totally. And Nicole, and I mean, maybe to sort of build off of Kelsey's response, it's like, do you think there's like a, it's in this kind of tension between different program types? Do you feel like it's, is, is the answer in the sensibility of the individual or is it, yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, I really, I really think it is because um, I always say when someone, when a student or former student is interested in Cranbrook, that its strengths can also be the, this, the weaknesses of the institution for that individual, you know? Um, and I think it's really, it's a place that I think it, if you know a lot going into it, I think you can find your way easier. Um, it's, I think graduate school can be such a transformative experience and um, I just want to reflect, this is like a very overwhelming and wonderful panel. And so I may need you to like, ask me the question again, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think that it really, I would second what Kelsey was saying about when someone is sort of interested in like the, the Cranbrook experience, I try to lay out as much as I can, um, because no classes is not great for everyone, but it has, it can be, I think it's so different than any other design curriculum you will ever see. And that is, that is why I think I recommend it to people. Um, I think that, especially in the way graphic design is taught at most institutions, um, Cranbrook is really sort of a creating attention with what um, that sort of linearity is that exists in most places. And um, yeah, I think. Totally. I mean, I think that's, that's, I mean, I think maybe what it kind of comes down to, especially when it comes to different programs and then like individuals that are in programs, Elliot, maybe, maybe the prompt I have for you is like this challenge of certainty to a large extent, you know? Oh yeah. You know, existing in the matrix of the unknown. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I find, I find, uh, I find that, you know, when I, I reflecting in my position, I reflect quite a bit on my time, um, studying in, under the McCoys and, um, this, I'm probably taking this in a direction that you hadn't intended, but, uh, the the baser side of me is a very competitive person, and and so therefore you know I want to do everything to the to the best of my ability, and so I reflect quite a bit on on how I saw the things that I saw that Kathy and Mike uh, did ex extremely well, and one of the things that struck me as odd, it probably didn't strike anyone else as odd, but but you know I, I often say that I got the got the um, impression that they. They really met people where they were, and they, they didn't they didn't pick horses. You know, it wasn't like a horse race. So, although everyone around me, um, all of my fellow students were extremely uh, were extremely dedicated, and they were extremely, I think, competitive in a way. Um, the the heads of the department were were really about the kind of interpersonal relationship and and. Um, so when when looking at when looking at the pedagogy, I think one of the things that has really has really uh, struck me is this idea that people can come into the department at, at a whole host of different levels. Cranbrook is, is is a kind of ship of fools, or or you know there are there are tons of, of wild cards. Like when I'm interviewing students often uh, for potential inclusion in the the department, we'll have somebody we'll have somebody that simultaneously is like 45 years old uh, and is extremely professionally accomplished, along with a 21-year-old. I mean, we, we actually have a 21-year-old in our department this year, and um, 
the, the, the 21 year old is absolutely on, on even footing with not just even footing, but is, is excelling, you know, and the point that I'm trying to establish is really this idea that, that sometimes, you know, people come from these, these wildly different backgrounds and they come in, some of them have been exposed to a tremendous amount of design and some of them have a kind of uh, sophistication deficit. But because the environment is so, um, so attuned in a way to the uh, proclivities of the individual, and it's all about teasing out the power of the individual, that, that quite quickly what you'll find is you'll find that, the, that, that there's, um, there's the capacity for people who, who don't really, who haven't been steeped in graphic design culture or, or contemporary art culture, or a critical or a theoretical basis to um, to make uh, very quick work of, of what we're doing. I, I, I'm, the one last thing that I'll say as a kind of anecdote is um, when I was in the, the, the department, there was this, a perfect example is there was a student, a fellow student of mine named Brian Shorn who now teaches in Alpena, Michigan. Um, but, you know, he came from the writing program at Brown University and did some, did some, uh, some uh, book work. Uh, anyway, he had, he had a, didn't have a very comprehensive graphic design background. Literally within six months of him arriving at the academy, his work was, his typeface experiments were featured in Emma Gray magazine. And I see that pattern over and over and over again, that, that, that if you give people, if you, if you give them sufficient room to to plumb the depths of their psyche and space in which uh, among a, a peer group to test the ideas out, you'd find that, that uh, people will really shock you with, uh, with their, um, with their uh, developmental speed and uh, the results of their, their labor. Lucille, was it, was it kind of the same for you, I mean, I you know, I was the last of uh, Kathy and Mike's. I was the last class with Kathy and, and Mike. Mm -hmm. They were amazing, and you know, just yeah, to sort of build off Elliot's thoughts, you know, I feel. I mean, this is my view. It's like I felt like Kathy and Michael gave us structure, even though there was no structure. There was structure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think uh, I. You know, I mean, uh, Nicole said it earlier, the place, the place somehow because of that context of the environment and the, the porosity of space there from studio to studio, you know, there are no walls, right? There are books, there are bookcases that separate one space from another. And the engagement is so fluid. And I think uh, the Cranbrook was this ideal environment for somebody who, as, as Elliot said, is still discovering how they can, how they can gift of themselves. And, you know, design happens to be the, the place we're studying there, okay? But really the developmental uh, uh, kind of, you know, the, the evolution of an individual runs parallel to the studies that I had. And I, and I, and I, and I totally, that's why for me, that two years in real time is nothing. Two years in graduate school, you know, is nothing. But the but the impact of that is so exponential, you know, that 40 years later, why am I, you know, attuned to what I got there, which is so different from what is happening there now, but there is a common thread. And the common thread to me is that commitment, you know, because we, we all are from different generations. And when I tell my students who want to go to graduate school, and they say, should I really go to graduate school? You know, what is it for me? And what was Cranbrook like for you? And what did you learn from it? And I said, okay, let's, let me do this, you know, like macro, micro first. Macro, graduate school. Let's start with that. Okay, why do you want to go back to school and pay, you know, $50,000 a year when you already have a baccalaureate and you have a job, right? What will it give you? And it is a kind of rediscovery of who you are, really. It's an engagement of part of yourself with the world and what you do through your the filter of your work so that to me is like you know the big thing is like that was what I learned from Cranbrook from the McCoys that it was never enough 
not in a bad way, but that there was never an end, you know? And so it was always like, you know, Kathy would walk through the studio and she said, oh, did you try this? Did you try this? And I said, okay, well, the questions never end, you know? And so I started asking those questions of myself and that was the big lesson. So then Cranbrook, so as, as everybody has said, it is not for everybody, but I am the evidence of somebody who had no idea <laughs> what I was landing into. And I realized I could be converted, you know, I could be transformed. And I have to have that capacity to see in a person from my conversations with them, not just from the work. The work is like easy, it's a foot in the door, but I wanna understand who they are as people. Is Cranbrook the place for them? Will they thrive? Will they be exponentially affected like I was? So, you know, I kind of like do some detective work. I, I'm not going to tell you my secrets, but <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> anyway, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very fluid environment and it requires a generosity of spirit because there are no doors. Lorraine? <laughs> well, you know, I don't think, um, well, when, when I went to Cranbrook, I was an undergrad. I think I'm the only person maybe on this panel who actually got their BFA from Cranbrook. And I mean, that's a whole other subject, but um, you know, so my trajectory was a uh, Detroit kid, go to Cranbrook, end up with BFA. Then I go to New York, work at Vignelli office and then I decide to go to as I called it real grad school at Yale and um, you know this is so loaded still that I can you know barely talk about it but it was my experience at Yale that made me realize how what a piece of artifice pedagogy is you know that it's a construct and I had experienced one kind of construct at Cranbrook, but I couldn't have described it without quite the opposite. And, you know, it was so interesting because when I feel like in my own education, I experienced two, uh, that actually the McCoys were still modernists when I was there. But they came from a different, as we call it fondly, hippie modernism. They came from that 60s version of modernism where it was all about process hinged to a kind of utopian vision. So it was very open-ended, it wasn't prescribed. And then I get to Yale and I'm in the kind of old dead, almost dead modernism, which was formulaic and really more pointed at trade than anybody would have ever wanted to admit. I mean, I got incredible things out of my education at Yale, but I would say largely not in the design studio, just everywhere else. And, and yet at Cranbrook, it was in the studio, it was in that space, um, in that community and the kinds of discussions and, and what I was, um, you know, privy to as part of that community. I was uh, a few years ago, what about four years ago or five years ago, there was that show that Helen Molesworth put together on the history of Black Mountain. And uh, I was stunned by Albers's exercises with his students at Black Mountain, which appeared to be so much more open-ended than what he then went on to Yale to do. And apparently, I mean, in discussions I've had with people who know a bit more about this, Albers was really nervous about the university uh, environment and wanted to codify things more carefully and closely to justify the presence of design, which was a new, you know, a new addition to their curriculum when he came in. So I feel like I, you know, I experienced that early, early, early version of modernism, and then the kind of 60s version, and then could see how, and then of course Yale was churning out so many people were going into design education that this same kind of attitude there had prol proliferated throughout school. So I would say that it made me interested 
an understanding of, of design pedagogy in a historical sense, but also that that was really useful to bring forward into the present. And, you know, in a weird way, I think the fact that the Cranbrook model still works at Cranbrook um, is a, a kind of, you know, a sort of testament perhaps to the, I don't know, superiority of that idea for art education. And again, it's not that the McCoys invented it, it goes back to Lil Saarinen, but it is an earlier conception in this century of process and, and product or, and the making of things as being the way that you built a visual culture. So I, I find it endlessly generative and interesting to look at that, at that model. And where Elliot went today with noting how the model is under contention from you know, the onslaught and the ever increasing bizarreness of educational industrial complex, um, you know, I think that it has to be fought for even if it's just creating independence within a required class in a university department. And maybe maybe I can just like jump in and I kind of open up the, the, the third sort of round of conversation, maybe maybe continue with, with you, Lorraine, in terms of the, in that spirit, um, especially in 2022 and sort of fighting for, for, for some of these ideas, like what do you feel worked um, and what you've like retained in terms of the, the experience um, from the way the Cranbrook is structured in your own teaching in your in your years of teaching like what have you taken away and like what can you do you maintain that it, you would quantify as a Cranbrook thing a Cranbrook idea well I think that the um to to well first of all to always approach pedagogy as an organic process and then also to constantly question you know i just think it's human nature to want to construct a structure you know and i think educators you know are always like we don't have enough requirements and you know there it's just been the last um especially you know there's just this temptation to constantly pile things up onto students. And I think a really healthy questioning of one's old, one's own assumptions of what has to be taught. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not arguing for passivity or laziness at all, but um, I think the, the idea of requirement structures are really, suspicious to me. I think that's my old Cranbrook <laughs> neurosis. <laughs> I think we share that for sure. I think <laughs> everyone on this panel shares that. I think if, if I if I throw it to, to Lucille, like, do you, do you see like, um, in in this, like, retention of some of these ideas? Is it is it um, wanting to see more of this structure, non-structure, like, you know, how do you approach teaching um, today in, 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 in a very different sort of global construct, uh, certainly in 2022 with Zoom and everything? Um, I mean, I, I've now been involved with two in, uh, educational institutions, you know, 20 years I was in San Francisco at California College of the Arts, and I started a graduate program there in design in 2000. Uh, and now that I'm at Parsons, I'm also looking at, you know, because we are still, we do not have an MFA in communication design. So we are in the midst of uh, really like trying to figure out what that next thing is. Uh, what, how does one define what a graduate education in design can be? Um, so I, I've, I've talked about this, quite a bit because I, um, you know, it, it's like, it always builds up on what is, um, what is out there, you know, what, what is out there that, um, you know, that one can pick and choose and adapt. But the other thing is also to understand what is going on in the world that you can anticipate so that you prepare your students for that. 
but you can never tell. I mean, you can never really uh, make a clear plan because you know we're not we're not fortune tellers. But what you can at least teach the students, and that's what I've you know in the last two years that I we've had the pandemic. Uh, I in fact in the first year of the pandemic, I taught two classes that I have never taught before at Parsons. So, you know, you can imagine I had to prepare not only the whole syllabus, but also to, to see, I, I'm not even going to see these people. You know, I'm not going to see them ever at all during the year that I'm with them. Um, so I was very keen on, on creating my own way of engagement, you know, that where, whereas, you know, because we only have the screen. So I, I had to figure out ways to, in my own way, to go beyond the structure, you know, to, to see them, to see people from who are from the same time zone, for example, because they were, we had international students, um, to actually meet them, you know, on a social level uh, in New York. I happened to be in New York for two weeks, and I said, I'm going to be at Washington Square Park, <laughs> and, and at, at the intersection of this and this, I'm at this bench, I even, you know, like put a Google map, and I'm there from 12 to 1 on this day. So even just that, you know, to see them, to go beyond the face and to actually see them as human beings. So uh, we ha I had to adapt. So how can I, you know, how can that um, consci being conscientious, I guess, that human beings still want to connect. So being aware that, th yes, we're teaching them, but how can I make that get past this machine, right? So. I'm just going to give a brief example. So in one of my first projects, you know, which I'm, as, as some of you know, my philosophy is really about personal voice. It's about understanding, you know, using your, your kind of cultural values, your, your uh, a, as a filter to see the world and then be a designer in that context. And so one of the things I, I told my students who were all scattered all over the world, uh, Northern hemisphere, Southern hemisphere, you know, East, West. And I just said, I want you to choose a person, place, or thing and create a project you know, around this subject, but it has to be something that is within your immediate environment. And so they had, and I had, it was a way for me to kind of like be wily about understanding where they were. I didn't have to ask them, don't tell me, don't tell me what city you're in. I don't, don't tell me what time zone you're in, but that, that subject is going to be my window into your thinking, into your, you know, why, the choice of that uh, as a design project. So, uh, you know, this is, the, I guess, if you're looking at ways to um, in, expand on, you know, classroom teaching, um, one thing I also wanted to let you know is that in all my years of teaching, I have never gotten as many emails and letters of appreciation as I did during the year of the pandemic. So it was not like the kind of thing that says, thank you for a great semester, Lucille, whatever. But it was very detailed that they knew, we both knew that we were trying, that there were efforts made to bridge that digital divide and to make it meaningful for them because we're not, we can't see each other. Uh, so is that a design project? I consider it a design project. Mm -hmm. So I, the obvious sort of like question for Elliot is like the, within the context of, of your experience as a Cranbrook student, like what, what are the things that you retained or what are the things that you maybe modified, like how much of it um, in, in evolved for you sort of teaching and running the department now? Yeah, I mean, uh, Lucille and, and Lorraine, I think, uh, really, uh, there's a kind of arrow right through the heart of the matter. Lorraine's comments, particularly about about keeping the pedagogy organic, um, you know, I've, I've, I, I, I really don't want to sound old. You know, today is, in fact, my birthday. I'm, uh, I turned 36 today. <laughs> you look great, Elliot. Thank you. Actually, my <laughs> wife tells me over and over that I should claim that I'm 83, and then people will, in fact, say I look That's good. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but the point that I'm trying to establish is this idea, of, again, that I go back to this idea of how the, the model, uh, 
how the model is a really unique model, but that, that the transactional nature of our culture is really, is really putting pressure to, to, to uh, formalize things. And, and I, I reflect on, not that necessarily my time, you know, our time in the studio is better than today. In some ways it was, in some ways it's worse, to be, to be frank about things. But, but to, to, uh, there were vast swaths of emptiness uh, in my experience at Cranbrook in terms of programming that were really critically important in terms of my ability to think about my work, where, where, where my colleagues like Martin Vineski, who's an incredibly talented and, and, and ridiculously intelligent uh, graphic designer and educator, we were uh, classmates, and it was basically that uh, in, that, in, that, in that emptiness, what you would end up doing is you would end up kind of um, finding people, finding a cohort that would challenge you. And so I think that the, 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 one of the biggest issues is I have to, I have, my, my colleagues and I have to co constantly strive to maintain a kind of emptiness within the, uh, the pedagogy. And then I, then I should say, I should say that um, as a shout out to the Cooper Union, I have a 19 year old son that is currently there. Uh, and so I get it. I actually get when students, you know, I'm paying to go to Cooper. He absolutely loves it. He says it's a fucking great institution, and I'm not just saying that. But the point being, the point being that, you know, I'm paying, I'm paying for that. So I think to myself, what am I getting in return? So when people come into a place like Cranbrook and you say, you know what you're getting in return? You're getting a, you're getting a cohort that are super intense, a cohort that are going to challenge you. You get, you know, you get all of these other things, but you get some emptiness as well. That's a hard sell. And I get it. I get it because, because to a degree, I'm a consumer of education as well. So there's this kind of paradoxical condition that, that I'm constantly, and that my colleagues are constantly up against where we're trying to maintain and trying to communicate to, to uh, a pretty receptive group of people that, that, you know, that life in the studio, once you leave Cranbrook, unless you go, to, unless you go into a very specific type of commercial environment, is faced with doubt and uncertainty. It's faced with, you know, like, magical elves didn't come into my studio last night and make my work for me. And it doesn't, it doesn't take place, it doesn't take place where someone comes to me and says, hey, Elliot, here's the, here's the project brief. That doesn't happen. And so what we're trying to do, what, what, what we try to do is we try to, to try to replicate to a degree the kind of freedom, the intellectual, emotional, and spiritual freedom that you would have in an environment like, like your own studio in Brooklyn, or for that matter, your own studio in Alpena, Michigan. You know, when you, when you in fact leave this environment, You've got to be able to. You have got to be able to face those. You know, face those. Uh, I don't know those demons or the 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 beauty, the horror, the ugliness, the power, all of those things that are that are possible possible in the studio, and they don't come from someone doing it for you. I just like passing this this to to Nicole in terms of you know I. I, I you're, you're teaching at the grad level, you know, and I think like a lot of what we're talking about here is, you know, the, the difference a little bit in terms of like the graduate level and the undergraduate level, like you sort of straddle like both spaces um, specifically and not, not to say others don't, but um, in a way, like, do you see things that uh, translate or don't translate uh, from Cranbrook model to like what, what you're seeing in VC? And VC is a wonderful program. Uh, just, uh, just in terms of your perspective there too. Yeah, I guess right before the panel started, I told Kelsey, I couldn't even count all the people from Cranbrook that I've taught with over the eight years that I've been here. David Shields, Dan Sinclair, Lap Lay, Emily Sarah, Wes Taylor, Sean Medina, Kelsey Dusenka, Anthony Nguyen, Jennifer Elsner, Shiraz Galab. Like that, uh, <laughs> that's like a mouthful of people. And um, I think something that I see translating for me from our program from sophomore to senior or in the graduate program. Um, I wrote down when uh, Lorraine said, uh, you know, ped pedagogy is a construct and I wrote pedag pedagogy is a question. It's not a closure. Right. And so I think that at VCU, I think trying to find those openings, trying to push out, and, and, and not have, 
firm answers and know that you're going to keep asking questions is something that I've tried. And I think a lot of my colleagues have tried, and I see that happening at other institutions as well. Um, this idea of, I think, you know, so when I was applying to grad school, um, my, my studio partner, Amelia Irwin said, you know, Cranbrook, Cranbrook is amazing. And it's also gonna be an uphill battle after you leave it, explaining what you did for those two years. Uh, even I think after this panel, people will leave maybe with more questions of what is actually going on there. Um, and I would totally agree with that. Like 10 years later, you're, I'm still explaining myself. Um, but I think, you know, that time and space, trying to figure out where you can carve out time and space in, in any institution is, I think, really radical because all institutions are problematic. We're pushing against uh, requirements. We're pushing against credits without, you know, all of these different constructs. And I think being at Cranbrook really did teach me to question everything, sort of thinking about all institutions as being problematic and, and rooted in sort of like white supremacist capitalist, you know, ideas. And how do you, how do you push against that? How do you, uh, how do you get your students to push against that while also feeling supported, nourished? How do you feel nourished? Um, like, I think that these are questions every day and one like tangible example, and this is little, but over the past two years, you know, on zoom, you know, I think everyone thinks, well, all, all educators are doing this. We're all, we're all doing what these people are saying. But I think that I've witnessed people not be flexible. I've witnessed people not ask questions. And, um, you know, we switched from an attendance policy to a presence policy and sort of thinking about for students, like, how do you feel present in a class? Are you present? And I think that even just like, figuring out how to tease out new language to use um, is something that is deeply rooted in how Elliot has been running the program. Um, I think about things that Elliot said to me that I then pass on to my students, especially in the graduate program. Um, you know, these, these, really, these really big questions that I probably will never answer for myself, but I continuously come back to them because they truly sort of shook me in a way where I came in thinking one thing and uh, sort of left maybe more confused than I had come in. And I think that that, would, that is something that I think I and a lot of my colleagues try to do at, at different institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think that like one of the one of the sort of interesting things that I've encountered, like my my uh, years of teaching, like the and I think it's also generational too, like the changes in generations, like the the trust. I feel like that one of the things I retained from Elliot in my time at Cranbrook for my peers is like the trust in your peers. And then I think that helped me translate into the trust of my students uh, to kind of let them hold them accountable hold them when they need to be held but but also just trust that they could be adults and and can structure and grow in in ways that as long as you give them you feed them but but um it sort of creates creates that growth which i really appreciated and, and was very helpful for me to keep hold of when i started teaching kelsey in terms of your experience across across uh, schools you, you you had experience with mcad you also had like teaching experience at, at purchase um, and, and you're at RISD now, would you find translates well from Cranbrook or are there things you find don't translate? Um, obviously we talk about like, you know, fit and, 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 and you know, grad level, not level, but in terms of like the things that you've, you've experienced from Cranbrook in terms of your experience teaching. Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the things that translates well or that's especially needed over the past two years is that idea of nimbleness, which I think, you know, Lorraine and Luc Lucille definitely touched upon. Um, in terms of like what I take forward, um, maybe similar to what's already been said, but in order to leave space in a structured curriculum, it 
means sitting down with the student to really find out what they're curious about so that you can work with that student to figure out like how can this project be the stimulus that this person needs at this this moment in time and so i think you can bring that nimbleness or that responsiveness into these structures um, by simply being curious with the students and you know i would say everyone on this panel what we're expressing is like man, we got hungry at Cranbrook and we got curious and this has sort of like propelled us forward in certain ways. And I think in the best ways, any of our thesis students or any of our undergraduates at RISD, they're curious. It doesn't matter if I'm there. I've, I've, they've, they've unlocked something inside of design which allows them to be curious. Um, and I think like that's a really important thing um, that I've been able to work to try to apply because like other institutions, there's been a certain documentation requirement of like what a thesis should look like and, and, and what needs to be inside the book. Um, but the truth is like that doesn't document one's practice or ways of interacting with design very well anymore. Um, and so I think like, you know, I, I think a lot about like, how can we leave space? How can we be nimble? How can we adapt to be present? How can we be mindful? Um, and I think a lot of that is still possible with inside of structure. It is harder. Um, you know, at RISD, we had conversations like, well, it's a five hour studio. What do you mean we don't hold them on Zoom for five hours? Like, what, what you know, like, so to these questions of trust, like trust is fucking, uh, trust is hard. Um, and, and, and even our most utopic visions of ourselves and our design philosophies, I was in my classroom going, ah, oh, fuck, like it's just me in an empty Zoom room because no one wants office hours with me, you know? Um, and so I think like, you know, to trust students is not so easy. Um, to leave space is not so easy. I wish there were recipes in order to how to do this, um, but I think Cranbrook encourages you to have to do that inside of your practice and with your peers and with your supervisors and with your faculty mentors. And so that sort of code switching and adaptability you learn through muscle memory. Um, yeah, I don't know if that directly answers the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I think it does. It does. I mean, it's like it's 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 all very sort of different, different, uh, difficult. It's all it's all very difficult. I think it's also like very hard to do this, and um, we're all you know in, completely enmeshed in in like, um, for 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 better and worse, like in in the 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 juice, the sort of the the Kool Aid from from Cranbrook. So it's like um, we we kind of see the, the 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 same perspectives, but um, it's interesting to see, and I think it's interesting to see like kind of the the conversations that are happening in chat. We'll definitely get to some of the questions that are being brought up, and um, we'll just take maybe one one last round, uh, um, and then we'll we'll address some of the stuff that's happening. Some really good conversations happening there. Yeah, I mean, I think the last question kind of bring it full circle is. You know, I think design programs holistically are in, in a moment of, in academia in general, is in a moment of radical change, right? We've had to deal with two plus years of the pandemic, which is, has limitations. I feel like in-person studio critique is so huge and so important, and you you lose that partially. And now, you not only that, you have, you know, all kinds of different media and, you know, di different kind of realities where design has to live in situ, right? Um, and so I wanted to learn a little bit more about, you know, as design programs are, are evolving and changing so radically, you know, and just, you know, starting with you, Kelsey, what do you feel like is the biggest opportunity within that? And maybe what, what's the biggest blocker or biggest challenge in, in the next like year or two? Yeah, I mean, I think we actually like we absolutely are at sort of a tidal wave. Um, I think we see that in many different ways in design education. We see graduate students unionizing, we see faculty and staff unionizing. There is a strong uh, heave of sort of uh, labor movement, um, if we will. In terms of like challenges and opportunities that design programs are facing, I think all of us are contending with a myriad of problems and a myriad of opportunities. One, um, 
we've gained new literacy of tools that have democratized education in new types of ways. Um, I, you know, at RISD, I love using things like Slack or, or chat message, even inside an embodied classroom, because students are engaging in ways that they feel more comfortable with, right? Like emoji reactions, awesome. I haven't gotten that student to say anything ever before. And here they are kind of going off in these ways. And so in terms of opportunities, I think like, how we teach, like literally how we communicate and what participation looks like. I love Nicole talking about the presence policy. All of these conversations must continue um, at this place moving forward. We cannot return to what you know education used to look like in 2019. Um, some of the challenges that we face are um, access. Like RISD is about to cost, I think like $70,000 or something insane like that a year. Um, and we cannot preach um, equity and inclusion if we don't enact practices which encourage and have uh, pathways for success for, for student populations and student experiences. And so I think one of the challenges facing education is frankly funding and support. Elliot's been kind of talking about this, like what is the value, right? Like, you know, how do we encourage people to understand sort of these things? And so like, we need to talk about funding and the value of education in America. Um, and that's, that's a big uh, issue to sort of tackle. Um, and the other challenges that I think we're going to face is we're going to have student groups, especially um, at intersectional uh, places who will be coming in at largely different points than incoming classes ever have been. Um, social interaction on Zoom school in high school is way different than actual social interaction in an embodied classroom. And so all the ways of communicating that that we, we almost think a lot of times our students have coming in, I think we're going to have to reevaluate um, how do we place emphasis on sort of like soft skills or learning skills and observation skills because experiencing the past three years during formative years will change the cohorts of individuals coming in. Um, and then in terms of challenges like faculty retention. Um, junior faculty are increasingly carrying burdens of not only, you know, unequal student debt to our colleague, like colleagues and peers, but we're carrying burdens of our students who are in our offices because they can't go to anyone else. And so I say that as a trans man, and especially at a place like RISD, I have students inside my office from other, other places inside of RISD because I'm the only one where they see seen. Um, and so in terms of challenge, institutions need to recognize that, um, you know, junior faculty are facing not only these challenges of, of burdening of debt and sort of welfare of life, um, but we also are carrying more burden than our colleagues and peers in terms of service and commitment to our departments. Um, yeah, but like, I am hungry. Like, I am so excited because like, I think we're, we're kind of like at a point where the ship is actually really starting to turn. And because we can talk to other people and in other institutions like we are doing here tonight, we can share uh, organization strategies and we can share knowledge strategies. And I think that's gonna be a really unique thing in, in really steering the future of design forward. Totally, N Nicole, you wanna build off of that? Sure. Um... So the question was sort of like the issues or hurdles in design. Yeah, the, biggest, the biggest opportunities and the biggest challenges as we. I think um, one of the biggest opportunities I still think is sort of what can happen within either the space we're in here or a physical room. I think that there is like a power that like you it, it it's like in intangible but you feel it when you're with people people who are 100% in with you um this text that I give to to students and friends all the time is called uh, against curation from uh, by Lydia Perta I've I've shared it a million times but like um it it really talks about sort of why why people in a space together are important. And, and that's what I keep coming back to as an educator. Um, I think that thinking about education 
and I talked about space earlier or place, but I do think that the place you study is something that needs to deeply be uh, thought of when you think about going to Providence or New Haven or Los Angeles or uh, Minneapolis. You know, I think that um, thinking about you as a person in that space is, is I think something that sometimes we forget about when we think about schools. We're just like, I'm going to go to VCU. I'm going to go to RISD. I'm going to go to Cranbrook. But you are becoming a part of hopefully a greater community that is, that is bigger than just the institution you're in. Um, I think, uh, you know, just going off of what Kelsey was talking about, that sort of um, lack of equity with educators and students, I think that's something uh, I've been really heartened by our scene, um, my colleagues and I uh, organizing, forming a union in a right to work state, um, seeing graduate students do this. B Oakley, who's in the chat, B was in a graduate workshop with me where uh, it was centered around radical pedagogies and the last project we threw out the window and the students uh, sort of papered the dean's, the building that the dean's office is in about adjunct pay. You know, I think that these are um, hurdles that um, we have to, we have to talk about not just with educators, but with our students, because I think that it's a conversation that um, is, is left out a lot, but it affects their experience. It affects our experience. Um, yeah, and just like thinking about support in different ways. Um, support as in the people that you, that you join, but also support financially. Um, when I was asked, when David Shields asked uh, about, you know, starting to direct the grad program. I was co-directing it with Roy McKelvey. I said, I only feel comfortable if I can do this, if um, I can lower the number of graduate students so that they're, they're better funded. Um, and I think that that's just something we all should think about. It, it, it's some, and the, the, at, the administration's not happy about it, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think these are ongoing questions and hurdles, but I feel heartened by my colleagues and the students that I work with to, to keep sort of pushing back on them. Great. No, I mean, it's, I mean, I think it's, it's going to be the next three to five years, it's everything is going to be different. Right. And so it's, it's being very optimistic, but best, but also being very like, you know, shrewd in your decision-making and, and advocating for each other. Totally. Um, Elliot, the, you know, challenges and opportunities for Cranbrook as a department and as a, as a school would love to know where your, where your head's at. Yeah. Um, I, I, I definitely consider myself an optimist. It, it, you know, I, I, I'm critical and therefore I, I, uh, maybe I'm a pes, pes optimist, uh, but Nicole's final comment about about uh, being optimistic about things, you know, not to not to not to be negative, but I'm really not optimistic about things, and uh, it's because, as I see it, the value proposition for education is completely upside down. It's just out of control. If you think about, like, one of my favorite, you know, one of my favorite educational sites is Domestica, as an example. Um, it's a span. I believe it's a Spanish. It's like LinkedIn Learning, but it's I think it's from Spain. I mean, they have they have uh, English material, um, you know, and of course YouTube. Uh, but Domestica has great classes on there, and I and I think about the time that I when I was a 19 or 18 year old and went off to the Rochester Institute of Technology to learn the um, the strange art of graphic design. That was a highly technical knowledge. That was a highly technical knowledge base that uh, that you could only learn through like a printing college or get, get a BFA through a very specific and technical, almost vo vocational or trade. You know, how are you to learn what a pica was back in uh, 1988 or 1984, what, what, whenever it was? Uh, now, clearly, you know, the, the, the built-in learning tools in, in, uh, in um, Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop and InDesign are, are mind-boggling. So what is the value proposition? And you were talking about... Kelsey, you were talking about RISD being $70,000. NYU's Tisch School of the Arts is $86,000 a year. 
Now, I don't know if you've done the math recently, anyone in the audience, but that's $344,000 for four years. So, you know, what is it that we're offering? What, what, is it, what is it that we're offering? And I think the great part, this is, this is a sales pitch for Cranbrook, but, but it's, actually, it's actually completely true um, in my mind, is that we, we never played that game. You know, that's not what, we, that's not what, we're, what, what Cranbrook has ever offered. You know, like, a, like there's this idea of that you stir the pot deeply in order to, um, in order to really, uh, in order to really affect uh, change in a way. And 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 Cran Cranbrook Academy of Art, I think, and particularly the the design department, has always really been about this idea of of the, that if you change the way that you think about the work, if you change the the fundament your fundamental assumptions about the work, the work itself follows that. So, you know, the challenges that we face really are that, again, I go back to this idea of the transactional nature of, of, of our entire life, sex, politics, religion, uh, everything has, is, has become transactional. And, and so therefore, I, I think that, you know, it is a harder sell, the, the, the idea that like when you can't fully and easily describe what it is that people do in a studio like this, it's a harder sell. And, and that is tied, I think, in a lot of ways to the, to the viability, to, to, this, to this idea again, and I don't wanna to be too dramatic, but this idea that, that an institution like Cranbrook is threatened by the larger culture. Now, now, of course, I think that there are incredibly strong, smart, and talented people here, and that they're, they're committed to uh, the entire apparatus, the entire alumni group, I think, are, are, are committed to, uh, to trying to preserve that. But if you look at everything that's happening around us, it's just, it's bleak. Sorry, sorry to go negative. Lucille. Okay, you, I'll, follow, <laughs> I'll follow, follow up with the bleak scenario that, the bleak scenario that Elliot uh, observes. I, you know, it, it is so, it is a multi-layered, the challenges that we have in terms of higher ed are real, you know, in terms of uh, accessibility, affordability, um, and as well as how administration treats their educators who are in fact the first line of defense. And they're the ones that are, you know, giving that valuable or the value proposition. I, I hate that because it's so, it's so business-like. But what can I offer? You know, here I am. I'm, I, I am teaching my students next door. I have 15 students waiting for me. And, um, you know, th there's always the, there's always, when I ask them, by the way, this project that I'm giving you, are you going to show that in your portfolio? You know, because I have to say that when I graduated from Cranbrook, my portfolio was su subject to scrutiny and questioning that they looked at it and they said, how do you expect to get a job with this portfolio? You know, and I said, why? Well, you know, it's not like, a, a, you know, you, you can't be employable if your projects are not something that's being looked, for, looked at, looked for by the industry, industry. So, you know, you're not designing book covers. So you have no book covers on, the, on your portfolio. So who's gonna hire you? You don't do annual reports. So you don't do websites. You don't have anything in your portfolio. And so I, it made me realize, do I go for the, for the tangible, in, you know, the tangible, employable, easy to read portfolio? So that, you know, it is not, it's, it, you know, it, I realized after doing this so many times when I was looking for work and showing my portfolio around and carrying those big portfolios that the people who needed to see what I was about needed to look more closely you know, that they had to read between the lines and that I could engage them in conversation, that I, my work was in fact, just the starting point of a bigger understanding. Um, but not everybody has that patience. And so all I can say for now is that, you know, I am confronted with my students who are deciding, where do you wanna work, right? You know, they're talking about their starting salary of 90,000 because they wanna work for Google. So what I can tell them is that that is a short-term fix because technology is here and you will be hired even before you graduate. And you can tell your parents, I got a job. But then you go beyond that and look past that era 
what have you gained then? And so I can only tell them, I can only teach them. I can teach you how to adapt. I can teach you how to use your skills, you know, to be under, to be very cognizant of materiality, you know. Yes, you're doing everything digitally, but take a look at process. How are things made? You know, how, how are, you know, what's craft about anyway, right? I mean, we cannot avoid something that is tangible. And that's what I can give my students is to make them see that there is technology, there's the digital life, there's the digital career. But then what makes you human is what Kathy McCoy says, is really about the, the humanist aspect of your, you know, your contribution. And that cannot replace anything digital. That is my, I, it's not pessimistic, I hope. <laughs> Lorraine, you wanna final thoughts on uh, the challenges and opportunities for? Uh... Well, I have two thoughts on it. One is a kind of macro view, which is like, I, I, I admit I'm less familiar with the university con construct like say VCU but the private art school world, you know, is, is literally running on a business model that doesn't work anymore. And it's the tuition based model. And, you know, like it's one thing to be mad at the dean or, you know, the president of the school, but it's another to look at the board. Every one of these schools has a board of directors that is backing the president and they are the people who really set the policy. And they're also the people who, for whatever reasons, like social or, you know, prestige of being a supporter of a cultural institution, haven't really, I mean, with the exception of a few who really look at this statistically, they, you know, a lot of them do not understand that they are literally running their own institutions into the ground by not creating more robust financial supports than just either increasing the student body or increasing the tuition. This is what's gonna kill like half the art schools in the next few years. So, so there's that. And I, I think faculty even have a tendency to be either kept away from their boards or pushed away from their boards. And until faculty start building real lines of communication with those boards, it, it's, it's bad. Okay, so there's that. The flip side, I have to say last Friday, I went to a CalArts faculty retreat. We're doing this big internal thing where we're looking at curriculum across the institution. And the overwhelming desire is to, you know, CalArts has like six silos, like film, dance, theater, art, yada, yada. And, you know, again, in that kind of weird inorganic aspect of education, big walls have been built. And at this point of desperation, where we have all those same, well, the only problem we don't have is the adjunct one, but we've got the same problems with rising tuition, diversity challenges, uh, accessibility challenges, all that. The faculty are still somehow like, a a strong group of people willing to look at, the, at themselves and try to figure out how to bust through those the, stri the strictures that we have created ourselves to realize again that none of it is set in stone. And that as educators, I think you can just, in the face of all this other bullshit, to keep alive, you know, to keep the process alive in your own brain as being in your power to change is just utterly critical. And that's what I walked away with last Friday. And it reminded me of my, my beginnings as an educator. I, th I think it's, it's it, everything that everyone has been talking about, it's, it's just like resonating or rever reverberating for, for me. And, and, and I, I think it's a kind of an interesting, like that Cooper Union is hosting and then, you know, as, as a, for a while like the leader in that the movement in terms of like the free education and um and and the sort of the power of of uh the voices that could speak to the power that the, you know the boards you know like uh, i'm sure mike essel is watching this right now hi mike 
you know, who <laughs> led the fight to to bring this back uh, and really took the hit for 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 trying to and and hopefully fingers crossed this this institution is on a healthy path towards returning to free to I think to once again kind of put the stake in the ground and say this is possible you can do this doesn't it, you know you know there's other obviously you know it's every institution has 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 but it's um you know that fight and and you know we we similarly face a lot of um a lot of these very similar questions a lot a lot of really hard hard thinking um i really appreciate all the the back and forth that everyone kind of shared and lots to think about um i think we can take a few questions um from from the q a and, and then see how kind of where we land i just wanted to kick one off and just maybe to not not to change gears a little bit but like we have um bringing it back to kind of the, the education like we um this lecture is embedded into the typeface design and we have like a, a cohort of students who are watching this i just was curious and maybe um anyone can take this nicole uh kelsey like uh, just your elliot like just in terms of typeface design lucille uh, matt uh lorraine like in, Never did one. <laughs> in, in, like in learning about typeface design like or sort of your practice or your like how important was it to your development um or or in or in vice versa in, like in teaching it like i don't know if anyone wants to i mean I'll, I'll i'll jump in um because i think for me it was um like why i went there um and i love you elliot but i remember asking you to tell me more about typeface design and you're like dude that's not why you're here um and right. I, I remember being like what do you mean like i came here like thinking about all of these things and thinking about all of these, these people that have passed through these walls and what you were trying to tell me at that point was like, dude, it's so much more than whatever you're drawing or whatever you think it's about. Um, but I was too angsty um, and young uh, to really hear you um, on that. Um, and so for me, like thinking about Cranbrook and typeface design was like a really, really big thing. Um, I saw the legacy. I thought that I missed the wave, but what I think I actually understand now is, you know, we're in the midst of a, another revolution with sort of dynamic surfaces and variable fonts and stabilization and all of these different things. Um, and so what Cranbrook afforded me was like one time to mourn uh, missing uh, the postmodernist wave, um, but second uh, ability to understand um, what might the future of typography hold. Um, and it sent me, thanks to David Cabianca too, to, to Reading um, to sort of study more. I didn't know typography was a thing one could study uh, before Cranbrook. Um, I would love to hear uh, others speak about, about this. Um. As someone who I would say I am not a type person, uh, I will admittedly, like, I think that I'm more interested in the idea of like giving form to language. And so that becomes typographic, but uh, I think my sort of undergraduate background was, was American modernism a hundred percent. And so I think that, um, going going to graduate school gave me the time and space to start to think about like what language holds and the potential of language and so um like I think of you Kelsey as like a type designer right and so I'm like oh I give form to language but I don't know if that's typography but I think that um the way language is worked through writing and through sort of like form and sort of like those things being inextricably linked to me like Elliot would always say like form and content are inextricably linked like that is that is burned into my brain um and so I think that sort of that idea has really been how I teach type as an educator um there's a lot of whys it's not the whys and hows are more important. And so um, the, the form of it, it has to be connected to that or else I'm not interested. Um, and so I think it's really important to think about that and sort of take a step back. 
uh, which I try to do as much as I can in my own practice. But I think in the classroom, that is that is really how I think Cranbrook informed my working of language through writing and graphic design. Just to just to add a, a couple of things. One is I think you really put your finger on something like that I that I've seen take place. <clears throat> you know, I have a thirty year history, I guess, or something with the the institution. There are people that have clearly longer histories, so I'm not trying to sound like I'm the, an authority. But you know, I was I was a graduate student when you know Jeff Keedy and and I wasn't here with him. I'm saying that I'm, I'm part of that part of that lineage where. Martin Vanesky, me, uh, a bunch of people, a bunch of people, both at Cal Arts and at Cranbrook and a couple other institutions, uh, were really investigating typeface design, you know, and um, and that it had a, it had a real cultural moment, you know, where like literally, you would look around and and uh, a typeface that was designed a typeface that was designed in the graduate studio, you would find that it would be in this kind of rarefied place on Lone Pine. And then six months later, it would literally, not figuratively, but it would literally be on a Taco Bell tray liner, or it would be on the, it would be the, 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 the marquee headline for, uh, for uh, Ray Gun or Beach Culture magazine. And so, so really, the takeaway is, is uh, I th Kelsey, you're, you're probably absolutely right. I probably did say that. And I think that there's two things. One is that, um, one is that Cranbrook is an incredibly dynamic institution where people are really, and I know you're you're part of you're you're specifically part of this. People are constantly the group, the cohort is constantly reinventing what it is to be here. So there's always this kind of desire. I think uh, I see a lot of students come in, and there's this desire to kind of participate in that kind of what I refer to as the formalist avant-garde tradition that happened in in, in the mid early to to, to late '90s. Um, uh, but but then what you end up finding is you end up finding, and I think Jeff Keaty wrote something about. I think it was him that wrote something about this. But you know it was like an arms race. So so things got increasingly baroque typographically and linguistically to the point where it became almost like glossolalia, speaking in tongues or something, and it lost its relevance to the larger culture. So actually the pendulum over the course of the 2000s swung back the entire, the, the, the absolutely the entire, in the opposite direction, which is that we found much to my consternation. And my dismay, I found graduate students in my in the studio that were that were dispensing with type and language altogether because what they thought was that that created a more open text that it that it positioned the work more as contemporary art. Now I, I don't agree with that at all, but but uh, but one of the one of the uh, I think one of the late motifs of this conversation really is that the, 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 that the the people that are in the studio and the zeitgeist itself are what drive are what drive the institution. So I could be in the, I could be in the corner being like, uh, you know, uh, you know, type and language can work in this scenario, but but there's there are larger sociological forces that are at play that, that I'm sure you all know about that just take over. Awesome. Um, let's see, um, maybe we can like shift gears and ask uh, something from uh, the audience. I want to just remind for folks who are here, um, if you can send questions through the q and it just makes it easier to sort through. There's been a lot of, a lot of stuff and, and I think like most of it kind of made it over to, um, to the Q&A. But uh, I think that there's one question that came in a little bit earlier and I think it's kind of like when we were talking about accreditation, kind of the, the, the structure, kind of lack of structure at Cranbrook, there's this question from Jennifer Clark. It says, uh, how have alums' business and artistic lives, successes, struggles been collected and learned from other than anecdotally, and how can the accreditation happen without that? You know, we have kind of a, a, a whole panel devoted to sort of the creative journey uh, next Monday, but, you know, in kind of the various ways, but I don't know if anyone has opinions about that in terms of the accreditation when you have a, a, a structure or a, a lack of structure, uh, which does not imply there is no structure, it's just just... Um, you know, how, how do you, and is accreditation even like valid in this, in this day and age? I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to hog the conversation just, just really quickly. I think one, one of the things that just super quickly, I, one of the things that has struck me about Cranbrook, and I think it probably is mirrored from my understanding, it's mirrored in other institutions is that one of the major contributors to the rise, uh, rising cost of education is kind of an, an explosion of administration. So why do I bring that up in this context, which is, you know, when I was a graduate student at Cranbrook, if my if memory serves correct, there was Royce Laid, the director, there was uh, his his assistant and there was the registrar. There were three people that comprised the um, the administrative apparatus uh, in the art academy. And now 
now they're for legal reasons and for other reasons and for good reason to a degree for good reason there are there's a, an exponentially larger uh, apparatus the, the point why, why that I raise is that that uh, Cranbrook Cranbrook is really a, is really a uh, nimble and very um, very lean, very 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 lean institution. So even even the even until very recently, the idea of collecting uh, like what the alumni are doing is is just not something that there was anyone that could do. You know, they're just it just it just didn't happen until until very very recently. Any other like thoughts just around the subject? I mean, like it's it, it's this always uh, contentious sort of thing. We all kind of all institutions we're we're in like the assessment benchmarking or or you know just in terms of like the um, uh, keeping track of how how you know where people go. I mean, I think we see this again. Like it's anecdotal, but it's kind of amazing to see the flourishing of, of the work, and we all stay in touch, you know, despite like the the not overlapping. I mean, I'm speaking just to the Cranberg, but I'm sure other institution, other alums share that. So are, is Cranberg accredited? I guess that's uh, when I think uh, Elliot said earlier, we were grandfathered in because, you know, are we in the US News and World Report? Sham. But, you know, <laughs> you know, is, is what is the metrics anyway, if the proof is in the exponential influence of a single school, right? How do you gauge you know, the metrics of that, the impact of that. I, you could do a family tree and imagine where those linea the lineage of, uh, of, of uh, education and that how, he, how it has spread. So, you know, wh what is the future of Cranberg? Is that, that do, we have to do we have to conform then to these structures just because it's dictated by ACAD? You know, I know Cranberg is part of ACAD, right? If it it is, yeah, yes, it is, and we and we and we and we, you know, it's a super long conversation. But this, yeah, this, no, I know. I mean, but <laughs> I, I find the accreditation discussion to be kind of silly. It because yeah, first of just, all, it's well, you know, I, I mean, I think a lot of school presidents should just resist. I agree. Um, I think I, I, actually Parsons is uh, leaving it. Or yeah, has, well, or, has, or, has, or has already left it. Good for them. No, it's, it's uh, I think the issue is compliance and yeah. there's actually no real reason for compliance. And, and Mike just said, you know, Cooper is also leaving. There's, I think that there's a big movement <laughs> yeah. across art schools to, to leave that behind. Uh, I think it was more of a cell tactic. Um, well, I think that there's like a, a good, maybe connected question from B. Oakley in the, in the Q and A. It says, um, does this freedom that uh, Cranberg help to give space for a non anti-capitalist position design practice? And what options does this program open in terms of the design practice outside the corporate world? If anyone has a, a thought or, or, or on that. Well, I have found that Cranbrook graduates are very adaptable and they could be in the upper reaches of a, car, a corporate ladder and can have their own studio. So what does that prove? You know, I just find that we, we don't just go to one place. You know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a kind of holistic experience of what a creative life should be or can be. And I think that is really the, the gift that Cranbrook has, has given. Um, it's, it's, it's scale, it's, it's uh, the environment, the community is what has shaped it and it continues to. So when, when I look, of my, look at my generation or at least my classmates who were with me, one is the CEO of this company or COO. And I'm like thinking, how did how did that person get to that when she was at Cranbrook? <laughs> you know, and I think did we did we have the business? Did we have classes about the business of design in the business sense, a corporate sense? No. So what equipped that person to be able to actually move in those circles? You know, so it's a rhetorical question because I'm speaking to the converted, like you all. Lorraine, what were you going to say? Well, I was just going to say that when I was a student there, there were also radically different philosophies of design that were all accepted within the program. You know, that, that there wasn't a, 
there wasn't a uh, party line, so to speak. And, and I think that that went on, um, you know, that went on for a while. Um, but, you know, of course, I mean, the whole thing about design is, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, that's such an interesting question. You know, because even if you decide to live in the nonprofit world, if you're operating in the United States, you're still working within the capitalist construct. And and I guess going back to my comment about board members, I, I'm more concerned with getting the capitalists to realize what they've signed on for and to support it with greater <laughs> with greater rigor. Um, there was one thing that I am scrolling through chat to see if there's something kind of that, that, um, I can find, I think Alan Horry was talking about, and maybe this is something that Elliot can talk about or, or anyone, I guess, on the panel. Um, and it echoes one of the questions from, from, uh, someone in, in, in our Q and a, one of our students, Martin, about like the constraints in, within a, a structure that is unstructured without a class structure sort of what those constraints and and i think I, if i'm remembering what alan was writing in, in the in the chat talking about like the writing component and the 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 value or sort of the aspect of writing that's present at cranbrook and how that has transformed and i found it obviously to be a, a very important structural element and, and i never really felt like i was asked to write prior to cranbrook where at least in the way that um Elliot framed it for me that that helped me grow tremendously and it felt like an extension of my design practice became an extension of my design practice but maybe people could talk about like the the importance of writing within Cranbrook or its role or or if you're carrying on that that aspect in your teaching in other places um I think also in that question there's like a it uh constra what constraints uh does does Cranbrook have? And I think that something that you don't realize until you get there, you think I'm going to a school with no classes or grades. I have all the time to make work. And when you get there, I think you find that there's actually so many things happening um, that you have to say no and learn what your boundaries are, um, which I think was personally really helpful for me to not have those boundaries set by someone else, but really to think about, okay, if I'm going to carve out a studio practice, how do I carve that out for myself when someone's not like your studios from one to 7 PM. Right. Um, and I think there is surprisingly a lot of things, not mandatory. We call it crandatory a lot of the time, because I'll go back to that term communal pressure. I think that a lot of the constraints come from sort of the understanding that you should be in the studio. Like that, that is sort of time well spent. That doesn't mean necessarily that you're making, you could be just sitting there, right? But like that time watching Buffy, writing an essay, like all of these different things sort of are the education. And um, so I just wanted to say that, uh, but I think that, yeah, I had never, written before Cranbrook and I came to Cranbrook feeling totally vulnerable, not, not understanding theory at all. I felt like anytime I wrote a review for a classmate, I was like getting stacks of books, trying to understand how to write about my classmates work. And I think that, um, that education one taught me that it's okay to not to like, say you don't know something and to try and figure it out on the fly uh, to, to feel comfortable jumping into any type of work, work that you might not like, work that you feel way too close to, work that you know too much about, you know, like all of these ways in which I think um, something I've seen consistent about people that have gone through the program, but also the school is that uh, there isn't this I'm not a painter. I can't come to your studio and talk about work. I'm not a graphic designer. I can't, you know, I can't talk about your posters. I think that that is something that really radic really transformed me. I think, you know, spending time in the sculpture department gave me new language to in fact, talk about graphic design because 
the people with a sculpture background had a very different way about talking about relationships to the body, which I had never heard, you know, ever when sort of like talking about design. And so um, those were things that came out of writing for me. Um, and I feel like the writing is, is something that I really hold on to and that I've kept doing uh, since Cranbrook. Uh, I sort of uh, like hide when a former student snaps a photo of my thesis book in the library. Cause I'm like, oh, like that stuff can go over here. But the writing, I can still be like, wow, that, that was rough. Every time it's like pulling blood from a stone, writing those reviews. I mean, we didn't even design, like we didn't design them at the time. I mean, we typeset them, but you know, Kelsey's, Kelsey's year, people were like designing tiny publications for the reviews, you know? And I think that that review structure of sort of writing about uh, your classmates work actually was a lot about you writing about your own practice. Just structurally re really quickly, the, the, you know, that's, that's been a, that's been a, a project that has developed over a 21 year period. And just structurally, Alan's question, I think is, uh, it's really interesting. And if you want to hit me up at eearls at cranbrook.edu, we can carry on the conversation. I can give, give you more info. But basically, um, you know, the aesthetic philosopher Morris Weitz talks about the idea that all criticism involves four different categories, which are interpret description, interpretation, theorization, critical assessment, and the fifth category is contextualization. But basically, what ends up happening is students in the department, they, they install work 72, it used to be 48 hours, uh, but it's now 72 hours in advance, and a critique matrix is drawn up at the beginning of each semester, where students are charged with writing comprehensive criticism of, of, the fel of a fellow student's work, and it, it's, it's to close read the work, so they're supposed to bracket off what they know uh, from what they know about the work. They don't go interview the student. And the primary task of that of that um, of that uh, of that crit uh, critique is basically in three different categories. There's the fundamental principle that all were all works of art, literature, and music are they're not a natural process. They're not a rock or a shrub. They're about something. So what you're doing in that in that writing is you're interpreting the work. You're suggesting possibilities for what that work is about. And then what you're doing is you're tying your interpretation to larger bodies of theoretical knowledge. So you're looking up what Freud would say about the ego or the id as an example and tying that to your tying that to your interpretation. Finally, the, the most important thing is you're looking for in the reviews, the students are looking for fault lines within the internal logic of the work. And so they're critically assessing the work. The fundamental activity of, of critique, if you look at the Greek uh, etymological root of the word, is to call work into crisis. So what the students are charged with doing is they're charged with calling the work into crisis. Now, the, the, the point is, is that, that, that those reviews are between 2,500 and, and 3,000 words. They're done every single week. They initiate our critiques. And as Nicole has pointed out, over a 20-year period, there's an added wrinkle to the thing over the course of the past, I think, 10 years, which is that those things become design objects, a form of pamphlet architecture. So. The, the student is, in fact, has to make the work as a kind of risograph publication or a kind of publication that involves design. So what they're doing is they're, they're, they're involved in a traditional design practice along with writing and an experimental practice. It's definitely like, I'll echo like the, the, the what, what um, Nicole was saying, like the, the, and I'm really thankful for Elliot's uh, structure and I appreciate like the explanation because I, I hope that people kind of understand like, you know, this is like the internal kind of lingo that we're talking about, but the the, the value of writing and, and I, there's the moment, um, I think somewhere like mid midway through my second year where like a light bulb went off and, and I remember looking at the, the discussion and the critique and the writing and I just caught myself realizing that like everything we were doing, like the writing that you were doing about someone else's work was really talking to yourself, you know, and I had that moment of realization of like, I was finding solutions and, and, and issues and, and friction within other people's work. That was my own friction. That was, I was able to self-diagnose and, and find ways. Uh, and, and that was like incredibly instrumental for helping me understand my own sort of practice and moving forward and like the, the generosity and, and the charity that you sort of bring forth with, that practice is is sort of giving back to yourself as well. And I found that like incredible, incredibly constructive. Um, and I just say quickly, you know, when we were at Cranbrook, we did not have a structure that required uh, writing necessarily. 
But I think uh, as somebody who's interested in language and authorship, I encourage my students and we have ways for them to do writing assignments. But uh, even in projects that, uh, even in design projects, I encourage the, their own writing uh, from not just from the content standpoint, but also from the, from the evaluative standpoint, because I do feel, as you say, it is a mirroring, you know, when, as soon as you put, you know, words to your thinking, uh, it becomes concrete. I mean, there's a way of a self-fulfilling situation in that way. Uh, but I do, I think my, what I learned from Cranbrook also, even if we did not have that, you know, we didn't have the requirements, you know, this is way before everybody was reading, uh, there, you know, when I think there was a time when even maybe it was when Jeff Keady was there, he said, oh, we don't want to do anything. We just want to write. <laughs> we don't want to do any yeah. projects. I heard about that. And um, but I, I do feel that designers need to be literate. You know, they can read and write, but it's about the literacy I'm talking about is really about how it connects with uh, meaning. And when that work, when that is so you know, when that is a consideration in their design work, because it is, you know, there's, ty there's typography, then it is to me the fulcrum of a, a very powerful work that the language that can, that design can transcend language, but that the, the marriage of language and design uh, and image especially is really what makes the work really um, provocative and meaningful. I guess I want to add just one thing, which is that, you know, you're, you're right to point out the, um, that writing obviously didn't have the kind of um, formal or formalized status that it has had since Elliot has been directing it. But Elliot, I feel like you built that out of a context of Cranbrook being a place where theory was taken seriously. And, um, and, you know, sometimes it resulted in posters that, I mean, I, I just noticed in the chat, Alan Sorry said, well, I didn't write. It's like, yeah, but you design posters with these amazing pieces of text, you know, that are essentially, um, you know, poetic versions of design theory, or there was a, always a, a very strong presence of language there. So I feel like, again, there's a legacy. And when you think of all the people who've come out of the program and who've continued to write or have brought writing in one form or another into their, um, into their uh, design studios, I think, that's, I think that is a legacy. Again, knowing that at universities, it was separated out. You wrote if you took art history or if you, you wrote if you took you know, a visual culture seminar, but not in the studio. It's that integration into the studio that I think is is a unique part of the DNA. Yeah, I, I can I completely agree with that. I think all all I was doing is is taking ideas that uh, that I saw around me. And as a graduate student, I, I actually Lorraine and you, you, there's no way that you would remember this, but we went to uh, Spago's, this this greasy spoon on Woodward Avenue. And I was <laughs> overwrought with my inability to, to, to grapple with this thing, this theory thing. And you looked at me and you're like, you don't, uh, you, I don't know if you, you said, you don't make work about theory. Theory is a, are lenses through which you understand the work. So I'm basically, basically well, all, all, I'm, all I'm doing, all I was doing is kind of thinking about, huh, in what ways can I, can I, uh, I don't know. You know, you, you think about your own experience and you try and build upon it. So I don't know whether it's been a positive or negative thing. The students seem to respond positively, positively to it, but it, it definitely, it was definitely latent or, or not latent. That's not the right word. It was in the, it was in the, the discourse without a doubt in a, in a, in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just being mindful of everyone's time, I really probably uh, should uh, close this out. I mean, we could be talking for, for hours and, and we hopefully will do more. I would love to kind of continue this and, and, and hopefully it's interesting for, for our folks watching and um, listening to this. I mean, Cranbrook is unique and, and it's not, um, there's obviously other unique institutions. This is just like a, a trying to kind of put a finger on, on something that, that that's interesting, kind of a structure that um, causes and uh, brings questions and, and has affected every every major institution. Uh, so I think it's good kind of to like navel gaze a little bit. I think it's okay, we're allowed to do that. <laughs> Thank uh, you for putting this together. 
Sasha. I think uh, <laughs> it was a it was a great opportunity to just like you know talk about this and uh, see how we all learned from it, how we gained from it, and how we continue actually continue yeah. to do it. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you Matt, for for working thank with you, me. Matt. For putting us together. Thank you, everyone on the panel, uh, for for your time, your wisdom, your 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 charity in, in, in giving folks like lots of things to think about. So, it's um, the Cranbrook spirit. It is the Cranbrook spirit, a hundred percent. So hopefully, okay. folks can join us next Monday, uh, same time, same place. As Mike says, same same bad channel. Um, so uh, catch, catch the next um, version, next chapter of this. Thank you, everyone. Have a great.